Hi, everyone. Um, I was here last year in this room. Uh, it was so exciting to be back. And um, I was showing some WebGL stuff last year, so I will uh, show a little bit more. Uh, we just had a uh, Q&A session before my talk, which was really nice. I get to uh, talk to a few people, so I hope it will be interesting for you. <clears throat> so my name is Aisha Gul. I worked at, work at Autodesk, um, and we build a 3D uh, platform for collaboration and file sharing and all good stuff. And I'm a Google developer expert for Angular team as well. And my name and last name is my Twitter handler. If you have any questions, I like it when people randomly ask. <clears throat> so first thing, why do I uh, care about um, telling your story with your data? Um, obviously, we have a lot of data <laughs> at the moment. And uh, it's a huge um, thing in Silicon Valley. I live in San Francisco, and everybody is collecting a lot of data. And um, <laughs> it's a big word that's been thrown a lot, uh, <clears throat> but uh, most of the people don't know what to do with it. We are very new to this um, data collection thing uh, ourselves. Um, at Autodesk, though, uh, we are working with a totally different uh, environment. We have a lot of 3D products um, that allows you to do, like, from manufacturing to uh, simulations to architecture and uh, film, uh, visual effects and stuff. <clears throat> but we um, also realize that uh, the services that we are trying to give to our uh, users are not exactly fulfilling uh, what they need. So last year I was here, and I, I think I showed this exact model last year, and I uh, hardly start working at Autodesk at the time. So we built this tool that makes it really easy uh, for you to share 3D files. Uh, which was really hard before. You had to have these um, really heavy programs um, on your computer to see. And, or if you wanted to share it with someone, you had to either render it uh, to a movie or um, print it, which is a painful thing. Rendering takes a lot of time. So when I saw this tool and I was going to work on it, I was like, yay, it's so cool. It's really helpful. But <clears throat> quickly realized that our um, customers are not as happy <laughs> as I was. Uh, because um, the uh, bridge that I showed you is a very simple, uh, simple example. But most of the time, the models are uh, amazingly complex, and users don't know what to do with it. And um, the person who's sharing the file is the person who made it and who knows how to use it, maybe. But uh, on the receiving side, people are totally confused what's going on. So we have all these APIs, which are uh, open. You, um, you can just go and use these APIs, and they're free, um, to build these uh, 3D models yourself as well. And this is one of the open source projects. Uh, it's on GitHub. And um, they took the uh, 3D uh, render viewer that we have, and they build on top of it. It's loading <laughs> very slowly right now, um, but it's a super useful thing. Um, I'll come back to this. So these are all uh, open source people who are out there build these things and just wanted to share it with you what we have missed. So this is the good thing about you know sharing, um, sharing what you build with other people. They allowed us to see what we were missing ourselves. So this is one of those models that's uh, really humongous. And uh, when you open it, you just don't know where to look. Uh, and you don't know where, what these things are. They're actually uh, energy uh, sensors that you can take a look. And um, you can click on different parts of the building and see the energy consumption. So I thought this was very cool, and you can um, do all these other stuff. Okay. And this is um, this gives me not only the model itself, but also 
all of the things that goes with the model. For example, if I want to see like how many pipes there are, um, this uh, pie chart is a D3 pie chart uh, added on top of it. And it has a click event, and then you click on it, and then you can see different parts of the model. So we have, uh, I don't even know the terminology, the curtain panels that I can relate to, and the pipes. And we have a reporting. I think uh, you can get the numbers and everything else. So it's really cool. <clears throat> if you ever want to take a look, uh, these are all in my slides, the examples. They're built by the community. And uh, the uh, APIs that are free are on forge.orders.com if you want to use it. But finally, we realized that we have to do something about this, too. Our users really need these things. That's why they're building them. Um, so we are building our first Angular 2 applications now. Yay. I'm very happy about it. Uh, and what we are doing is uh, creating an experience for the user um, and allowing them to create their own experience. And this is a very um, wake first example of it. It allows you to create some uh, views and then create some slides and you can share it and um, view it. And you can think of it as a PDF where you could turn everything. It's like a 3D PDF, which is <coughs> fun to work on. But as you, but as you can imagine, um, 3D is a very expensive process. Uh, so we have to really be careful about the efficiency. So we can't really um, uh, be very, you know, generous about how we use uh, people's energy and uh, web G WebGL. And most of our users are all around the world, and um, they don't really have the uh, access that we do here. So our toolbox is 3JS. Has anyone used 3JS? Oh, nice. A lot of people. Uh, I'm curious to hear what you're do building with it. Um, so it's a, a library built on top of um, WebGL, and it allows you to do um, JavaScript 3D uh, very easily and efficiently. And we are using AngularJS. Um, we have a huge um, application built with Angular 1 and building Angular 2 now. We are using D3 and uh, RxJS. So RxJS is something that I'm re really super excited about, not that I totally wrap my head around it, uh, but I'm still trying to uh, understand and learn it because um, it really allows us to do the uh, animations or um, user interfaces that we wanted to do. So you can uh, watch the, where the, um, what the user is doing with their mouse, how they are using the camera, and then capture it. And that allows them to go back, uh, like th do things like undo and save. Um, the other cool library is D3, obviously. So D3 stands for, for uh, data-driven documents. Has anyone used it? Yeah, uh, a little bit more. Um, I've been teaching D3 and talking about D3 for a while now, but um, I think people are very confused about <laughs> D3 most of the time. Hopefully, um, the new version will help people uh, a little bit better. But it's a really amazing library. It allows you to uh, manipulate the DOM uh, using your data and create these really cool things that you could even put it in your slides, which is just HTML and CSS. <coughs> but today, uh, although I love these uh, libraries so very much, especially D3, uh, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to use D3. <laughs> and you don't have to get confused about it. Um, <coughs> Most of the time, what we need is a very basic and simple functionality of the D3. And most of it is available to us now through uh, Angular animations. But I will show you some uh, D3 examples as well. So D3 had a newer version as well, uh, which is a smaller module that you can download separately, just like Angular 2 which allows you to have a smaller application and just use um, parts of it and not download everything. And it has an amazing open source community as well with lots of lots of um, examples. So 
I will uh, tell you all the things that you could do with D3 and also with um, Angular as well. So the most important thing, the first thing that you do with D3 is uh, make a selection um, in your document and then attach a data, list of data to it. So you can use that data to manipulate and create cool visualizations. All these things are things that you could totally do with um, Angular as well. You can definitely bind the data, data binding with the attributes, and um, you can do really cool stuff. And uh, once we have a selection, we have this is the uh, confusing part, I think, uh, where the data we have to manually uh, append and enter our uh, DOM elements. And um, when we are removing the data, we have to take them out. And I think this is a um, little bit more intuitive thing to do with Angular. And um, uh, since we are touching the DOM with Angular most of the time, we, I mean, most of the applications, we don't have to divide um, the DOM manipulation into more than one library. Transitions were something that was lacking before. <clears throat> we didn't have very good transitions, way, good way of making animations, but that's being solved um, thanks to the team. Um, the transitions are very, very similar the way they work, um, and they're really going to be useful. One thing I think uh, is uh, hard to replace is scales in D3. Uh, scales allows you to scale things to the size of your screen, um, the things that are in the real world. And um, that's something really hard to calculate. So um, you can just download the scale module and use it along with Angular. The way they work is uh, they take the scale functions, take um, a range uh, of values from, um, wait, I don't want to get confused. I think the range is the width of your, uh, width of your screen and the domain is uh, whatever the data that's coming in. And um, if you look at my slides later on, all these green ones are um, going to examples and resources. Axes is another thing, and it's really vastly improved in a uh, newer version of D3. It's really nice to use, and that will be really hard to build by yourself uh, with any other library. <coughs> you can absolutely use them, bo both of them together. I mean, most of the time, like, I think, uh, not here, but I gave a bunch of talks about how, why we should wrap up our D3 um, graphs into Angular components and reuse them. <clears throat> Basically, we have to create a render function for our uh, components, and then any time the data changes, we can uh, check that data change with Angular and then rerun the render function. And we have a bunch of setup, and I will show you the example. So my code is uh, on GitHub. I will uh, share the link. But I uh, just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the CLI team. Uh, has anyone used it, the CLI? Yeah? Anyone cried over it? <laughs> no, not yet. Um, it's, uh, I've been using it for a while now, and uh, it had um, you know, some issues at the beginning, but they're working really hard, and they fixed a lot of the stuff. And uh, now I'm using it in a production code, too, and it's really, really uh, convenient. All you have to do is just create ng new uh, application. And um, it makes it really easy to create your components and services and uh, not worry about um, including them. So <clears throat> the cool thing about the component is you could just take it and put it anywhere, reuse it uh, very well. But um, I work in this humongous application with Angular 1. Um, and although there were like hundreds of directives, uh, they were not reusable whatsoever. Not at all. And it was really confusing to work with. And I wonder how many people do that, but um, 
now I think we are getting to talk more about smart components versus dumb components, and I'm a huge fan of dumb components. Uh, most of the time, when you're doing it, uh, data visualization, let's say uh, you have a line graph or a bar graph, you're most likely, most definitely going to reuse it somewhere else. So think about that, and don't um, make it very um, specific to your application at that moment. You will definitely want to use that again. And uh, Angular really makes this very easy for us. So uh, we have an input and output, very straightforward this time. Um, the API is really clear. We can get a, a input data wherever we're using these components um, and then uh, do whatever we wanted to do. But we don't have to actually know anything about our data in our components. Uh, we can just expect a, a specific kind of data and we can have an accessor function uh, in our um, parent component that would um, manipulate the data in the way that we want. Another really useful thing is the um, um, lifecycle hooks. So now we clearly know when our component is being initialized, when the data is changed, when the um, component is on our DOM, and when we are destroying it. So <clears throat> these lifecycle hooks are making managing our application uh, so much easier. <clears throat> when we are first starting our components, the first thing that we want to do is just to do the setup uh, kind of stuff, maybe get our data from uh, a service and um, ng-on changes happens before ng-on init and also after any time a data changes. And that's a very useful thing because uh, what you want to do is any time your data changes, re-render uh, your component. And finally, the animations. Uh, they look pretty similar to me uh, to with the um, D3 uh, transitions. Now we just add them into our uh, component definition, uh, the metadata. It's just like the selector and the a template URL. That's another um, thing that you could give. And um, it's a list of the animations. You can put as many animations as you like. Uh-oh. <laughs> So um, let me go on to my example. Has anyone played with the animations yet? I'm personally pretty new to it. Can you see it? So there are a bunch of animations uh, just like put into this one component. Usually you don't really have that many. Uh, but I think it's... Um, kind of very clear. So we, I am defining a bunch of animations on this side. I don't know if you could see it. So I have a list of animations that I defined previously. So fly in and out, data change, and then uh, income, refugee count. But these are all different kinds of animations that I defined in an external file. This way I can just put every kind of animation that I can think of. If I name it well, I can reuse it anywhere that I like. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, importing that animations file. And um, instead of writing all of the animations in every component definition, I can just use the object uh, animation and then um, use the animation name that I want to. So I'm, I just close it to make it look more simple. But <clears throat> it looks a little confusing at first, but it's really easy to read once you uh, understand for the first time. So we, we have a trigger that we are using in our um, HTML. And the at sign is defining that it's an animation. Um, so fly in and out is the animation that's being uh, defined here with the trigger. And the um, style changes are happening here. <clears throat> so our transition, well, just like the D3 transitions too, are happening between two different states. So the first state here is defined by void, which is nothing. You, 
it's um, going to not be inside our uh, DOM, inside our view. And then uh, we have a star, that's the second uh, thing that we are going to. So star is the placement for wherever you are supposed to be. So whatever component I add this animation to, uh, it is going to end up in that place and then it's going to start outside of our DOM. And uh, we have some keyframes defined, so three different keyframes, and this animation will run. Hmm. So. so this is uh, the um, cards on the bottom are the ones that are defined by with that, those animations. And <clears throat> I'm actually um, giving you the very confusing first place, I think. So they look kind of um, confusing. But if they were occupying the whole uh, width, they would come from the same position, all of them at the same time. So the other thing that I wanted to show you is the uh, bar graph itself. Um, what we do is uh, just import the elements and the component from the Angular uh, library, and then uh, we have to import the D3 library as well. Uh, since uh, the, I have to also import the uh, typings because I'm using TypeScript, um, I have a service that I import. <coughs> Once I have that, I have a selection, app.bar, and that uh, is the component's name that I can use anywhere. And I can add the animations if I like to. I'm taking in um, the input data and defining a bunch of the scales and the width. And uh, in my init function, I'm just setting up the uh, first initial values uh, that doesn't need any uh, data. Well, uh, for the ng init, you could have the data too, but since ng on change will run over and over anytime the data changes, uh, I prefer to put the uh, pop populate function there, which is taking the data and then re-rendering the, um, re the D3 every time. And as you can see, the transitions are very similar. You have to uh, go from one state to the other, and then you have to define the transforms or the styles that you want to change over time. Um. And um, this is the uh, refugee data, the countries that um, took in refugees, and I did not know uh, the numbers, but it's really interesting to see. So this is uh, <laughs> where things gets interesting. I was hearing about this, like uh, all these countries are, you know, uh, opening their doors, but um, when you don't see the actual uh, graphs next to each other, it's really hard to understand. So this is the count of the refugees, and then this is the uh, GDP um, of the country, area of the country, and the population. I think it's interesting. And every time I uh, have a click event, I'm uh, re-rendering the uh, bars each time. So <clears throat> the first example that I have is uh, using click events. So uh, it's uh, very intuitive. That's a, you know, easy, well, something that we are very used to. Let me find where it is. So we have a click event defined on these buttons, and then every time uh, the click happens, we are taking the key and then rendering the da data that belongs to that. So this is uh, cool and all, but um, I've been um, wanted to use more of the RxJS, and um, I was very inspired by the videos that I watched. And uh, let me find the code. I am getting the uh, data, reading it. Um, oh, okay, this wasn't the graph. Okay. Uh, 
Am I running over time? Okay. So I have a bunch of graphs, and um, I have uh, two functions. Actually, so uh, this is, I wanted to make my whole slides with this, but I uh, didn't have time. So uh, I have the uh, plus and minus. So every time I um, go forward, there's a new uh, graph that comes in, uh, gets animated in, and I can go back as well. So I could have, I did actually at first uh, just use a click function, but then uh, why not use the um, ng animate? And I wanted to show, I mean, uh, RxJS. Just wanted to show you that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I know if Benlash talked already, but um, it, has anyone played with RxJS? Very few, yeah, well, <laughs> great. So the idea is everything is a stream. Right now, I am the stream here. I'm the um, um, observable, and you are observing. You choose to come here to this room, so basically you subscribe to an observer, and um, you, uh, however long this goes, hopefully you will uh, listen. But then an error can happen, and we can handle that as well. So we can actually create any kind of uh, user, um, user input as a stream as well, because we don't know when people are going to click away uh, or you know, go somewhere else. So <clears throat> here I have a stream of clicks um, from my buttons, that um, few, two buttons. And one of them is increasing, and the other one is decreasing. And they're both subject. And I am able to merge them together and then uh, create the counts with that. So I'm running out of time, but the code uh, is on my GitHub. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you.